Okay, welcome to lecture 23 in the Structural Geology class, fall 2012. And we're continuing our lecturing about the Cordilleran uh, origin, which is that part of Western North America that goes basically from uh, maybe central Mexico all the way to Alaska. And it's this chain of mountains. Uh, and as had presented before, it, you know, it's well studied, dominantly a convergent margin that really starts its history about 800 million years ago and, and is features this one continental plate interacting with numerous oceanic plates, basically the Pacific Plate and Farallon, plus lots of fragments coming in, mostly island arcs that are uh, oceanic and continental. And then this, these blocks coming in are called terrains. They have their own history distinct from the surrounding rocks and they are added to the plate margin. And much of what I'm talking about comes from the Moores and Twist book in tecto of, entitled Tectonics. So uh, this is the Cordillera is a young mountain belt that is kind of manifests the kind of deformation we see on the Earth in the last few hundred million years. And uh, so the western part of North and South America are one of these belts, as is the um, kind of chain of going from s southern Europe, North Africa interactions through Africa, southern Eurasia to India, Eurasia. And um, coming into just another uh, view of Western North America with greater detail, it is um, comprised of these suspect terrains, which are basically these uh, terrains that have been far traveled, brought from from maybe lower latitudes. We're also seeing the margin as being important in terms of having significant strike slip faulting parallel to the margin. Uh, and that's especially the San Andreas system. The voluminous magmatism, plateau uplift, and also widespread extension. So these cross sections I reviewed in the prior lecture, and they just slice across the northern one. A slices across uh, Alaska, showing pretty well developed subduction with some thrusting in the north uh, in the Brooks Range, although now inactive. The BB prime is basically a cross, cross Cascadia, and uh, so another good subduction system with important basin range extension in the orogenic core. And then the San Andreas system in the south, CC prime, basically takes these sub these convergent margins and slices the end off of it and moves uh, material that was once further south to the north as that chunk of ter territory was attached to the Pacific Plate, so that's basically Baja and Western California, mo slides to the north and uh, sort of chops the end off of the old subduction system. But much of that subduction system is still preserved and is what defines really a lot of the geology of, of California and points further east, including Arizona. So turning to Arizona, we see a lot of important history kind of at the edge of the margin. We're not at the plate boundary, but we feel effects from the plate boundary in Arizona. And so the Grand Canyon shows this with, uh, uh, you know, this record of the Proterozoic kind of assembly of this part of the region and then uh, passive margin sedimentation kind of right on the edge of the passive margin. In the lower portion of the uh, Grand Canyon, here's the Tapetes going up into the Right, Angel and Moave, and then as we go into the middle part of this Paleozoic sequence, we start to see sediment coming in from the the west and also from the the south and east as different tectonic events occurred, producing relief and driving erosion and and sedimentation in the area. And then the Mesozoic is really, uh, at least in this view, is is just at the very top or, or eroded away. The uppermost unit is the Permian Kaibab formation here. So uh, this lecture kind of moves to a bit of a summary of the plate margin history, and then we, we come talking about younger times, basically the Eocene to the present. 
But just as a, as a summary, these different cartoons that we had earlier, but basically tell the same story. We have, um, you know, Colorado Plateau is shown on the right of, of these graphics. And the Proterozoic to Early Mesozoic, we have a convergent margin with, with variable polarity. So sometimes the uh, subducting slab is attached to that part of North America, and then it goes down underneath an island arc and will close an ocean basin. But other times the, the slab is actually attached to um, the oceanic crust that's coming in, and it subducts beneath the continental crust. So this meso Mesozoic convergent margin is kind of the class is the classic um, margin that, as I've said earlier, really sets up the the geology for central part of Western North America and, and defines the the configuration of what we see in California and Arizona since then. Um, but there, there were some important things that happened after that, and this includes this shallow subduction in the Laramide. So in the early Cenozoic, the incoming plate was pretty buoyant, and so it didn't want to go deep into the mantle. It basically just kind of came right up underneath the uh, continental lithosphere, and this strong shear coupling at the base of the lithosphere helped drive important deformation in the plate interior. And so that's when we see deformation in the Colorado Plateau and even into the Rocky Mountains further to the east. So this diagram I'll come back to a few times, but what it shows is, is basically the Cenozoic, so Maastrichtian to Paleocene, this would be the uh, Cretaceous tertiary boundary, and then coming Eocene, Oligocene to the present. And it shows different kinds of things that occurred with a view of, of basically from the Grand Canyon region of Arizona. So there's compressional tectonics and these these gray these black sort of uh, figures kind of show when the this sort of rising and, and maximum and waning of each of these phenomena. So the first thing you know is compressional tectonics was active in at the at the boundary at in the earliest Cenozoic, we see important extension much later, uplift in the early Cenozoic, and then also in the Pli Pli Pliocene, volcanism in a few important times, basin formation, and erosion, and, and you know some debate even about the history of when did the Grand Canyon form. So I'm going to go through a few of these uh, in sequence. So the first thing that's important to look at is the, the formation of monoclines. So this map shows northern Arizona with the Grand Canyon coming through. And these lines show monoclines. So these are basically you know horizontal layers that then have a single limb that dips and then it connects with another horizontal layer. And these are quite distinct for uh, par parts of northern Arizona for the Colorado Plateau. And, they developed, they, we think they developed this kind of a model where um, there was Precambrian rocks with a fault underneath that was probably even maybe a pre-existing normal fault. And then we, we buried those Precambrian rocks with Paleozoic and Mesozoic sediments, which then are compressed during the Laramide time. And, but the fault doesn't propagate all the way through these layers. It simply develops this fold above them. So that's the monoclines. But what's important also to see is that then later on, so this would be the monoclines form in the Eocene and earlier, but in the late Cenozoic, maybe more Miocene and later, we see that these faults actually reverse their sense of motion. They become normal faults and they slide back down, basically breaking through the monocline. And then with subsequent erosion, we, we might have a, this fold that faces then some cliffs, and, and that's the, the old monocline that then was faulted. And so this is an example of, for example, the hurricane fault here in uh, far northwestern Arizona. That's shown up, up in this uh, area, up, up in here, of the satellite image. So the satellite image is, you can really stare at it quite a bit. Here's the main Grand Canyon, Kaibab uplift. Uh, this dark area is the young volcanic rocks just uh, east of Flagstaff. Here's the San Francisco peaks. We come down, 
here's the Phoenix area. So I'll be showing some satellite images like this, but this geology here is really kind of uh, developed by the history that we're talking about. So here's then a view from the uh, late Miocene as we come in and we see the the development of, of you know the San Andreas Fault starts to get going at this time but also there's significant volcanism sitting on top of a lot of like the old arc so there's erosion and deposition and then this great um, extension through the region basically down here in Arizona now is, is quite dead but at, at this time was still going and and in present time uh, though that extension continues in in uh, the, the Nevada area so that was basically looking a little bit at these compressional tectonics at some monoclines and then this uh, extension here uh, we see the formation of the South Mountains that big uh, fault so here's a view of um, the area in um, East Mesa along the Salt River where we can see the Goldfield Mountains which are volcanic rocks part of the superstitions and here's some more here Saguaro Lake Marina and so this is the these are part of this volcanism right in here at about 15 million years was big volcanic eruptions that form the superstition uh, volcanic complex and also the earlier uh, pictures I showed of uh, around Flagstaff the young volcanism is here in the Pliocene in recent times now this view is is <clears throat> coming back to the extension and what's what's interesting to see and we can see it in this diagram is the Colorado Plateau is sort of this relatively undeformed island that's surrounded by uh, faults that are all basically accommodating extension and the f westward flow of uh, basically California and extension distributed throughout the basin and range and even in the modern topography we see with the Rio Grande Rift kind of this narrow rift zone on the east side of the plateau and then this wide um, zone of of now inactive but formerly active extensional systems um, here in the southern basin range in Arizona and one of the things that's very distinctive about the extension that we see uh, is this low angle faulting so this is how we we discussed this before but how the South Mountains may have developed where we thin this crust on the edge of the Colorado Plateau and it really comes up along these low angle faults with then as the fault systems are active and the top part of the system has high angle structures we develop these sedimentary basins which are filled and we see that right in Phoenix area with the development of um, the Camel's Head Formation and and that's seen also in Papago Park Hole in the Rock for example so here's a 3D view looking at Tucson so this is uh, the Tuc the um, Catalinas are one of these core complexes that have come up from up from out from underneath the Tucson Mountains so this big um, normal fault would dip to the west and then for in the Phoenix area the big normal fault dips to the the east but basically they do the same work and um, it makes some maybe better sense when we think about the South Mountains as coming out from the the portions the areas further east which is kind of south of the Grand Canyon but the southern end of the Colorado Plateau but we can get both senses of dip in these big detachment faults here's a view looking over Phoenix and looking to the north with the South Mountains being one of these big uh, the foot walls of one of the big detachments that then tre heads kind of the fault surfaces now buried but would, would maybe come like this and so we can push the South Mountains back up underneath Red Mountain and kind of reassemble uh, this part of, of Arizona after it had extended quite a bit in the Miocene just another view a little bit closer uh, at, at Phoenix so to to kind of come back to our overview diagram this 
deep-seated flow, low angle extensional faulting was really uh, an early phase of major extension that occurred kind of in the early Miocene. And we don't know exactly when it ended, but <coughs> it was followed by a, a period of high angle extensional faulting that, that kind of chopped those old low angle faults off. Um, and so sometimes it's a little bit confusing, this sort of two stages of, of faulting, but you know, when we talk about the South Mountains, we're, we're really talking about the earlier stage. And then the development of kind of modern topography of the central Arizona basins and, and their deep fills is much more of a late Miocene to, to Pliocene process. And now in Arizona, these are faults are all basically dead, but the process is going strong in, in Utah and, and Nevada. Um, so the, the process continues further to the north. So one of the things that we can see is a, kind of this model for how the landscape might have evolved in Arizona with the initiation of these high angle faults, maybe cutting off the old low angle ones. So they initiate over main phase, very sharp bound, fault bounded mountain ranges might look like the Wasatch looks now in, in Utah, but this would have been, you know, a Paradise Valley or a White Hanks and you know straight straight mountain fronts basins accumulating kind of closed depressions but after a while these faults start to shut down and so the basins start to fill the mountain fronts started to be buried in their own debris and then finally the faults stopped moving and so then we fill the basin maybe allow through going flow so this would be like maybe the salt river going through and then the old ranges are eroded back and we have a lot of kind of low relief eroded bedrock and then surround surrounding these small remnant ranges and so this is kind of modern landscape of southern and central Arizona but it's really kind of due to this history of, of initiation activity and then waning and termination of these high angle faults and in central Arizona the termination phase is really about we think eight million years or so ago is the last active faulting in, in like the Phoenix area. So here's a view of the geology in Paradise Valley. So so this Salt River comes in here. Uh, ASU would just be down at the bottom of the picture. And these contours here show depth to bedrock, so 4,800 feet. So basically Paradise Valley is a deep basin that was once a, a form, you know, was a formerly active fault-bounded basin that it, it was pretty deep due to the normal fault-driven subsidence. And then be, after we turn those faults off, we kind of allowed the mountain fronts to erode back and the burial of the feet of the mountains to occur. And we have the, the we can only see that old basin when we look at the depth to bedrock. But it's the deep basins that are full of the groundwater that is part of the big water supply for Arizona, for central Arizona. Here's another view of that, that same uh, situation. This this is a view kind of looking north over the southeast valley. So this is still, you see the McDowell's here, so this would still be Paradise Valley. And then underneath Mesa and Tempe is another deep sedimentary basin that's another maybe slightly more complexly shaped, but former extensional basin. Same thing over in the Verde Valley, um, just on the other side of the McDowell's kind of uh, Fountain Hills would be here. It's one of those old basins still preserved there. So here's just, here's just another view of, of Phoenix showing, you know, the low relief now, but those old, uh, you can kind of see right here, this low relief of this Paradise Valley is kind of masking that deeper uh, basin. So looking at the geology around Phoenix, we see a really important pattern here and shown just if we look at the units colored by geologic age and so you'll see that most of the the mountains so not accounting for the quaternary valley floors uh, are proterozoic so quite old and then we have tertiary is the other main color and that includes the tertiary intrusions like the south mountains but also tertiary volcanism like here in the uh, superstitions and um, there's really nothing between them 
in terms of the geology. So this is because during the Laramide times, there was significant uplift in southern Arizona. And we removed pretty much all of the Mesozoic and, sediment and Paleozoic units, mostly sedimentary, that we observed in the Grand Canyon area. There's just a few up here, in Mesozoic units, the green up here in the far northwest, and just a little bit of blue here, in, um, kind of just near Globe, Arizona. But pretty much all of what's in the Grand Canyon sedimentary sequence is what is deposited here, but has been eroded. And that difference really is an important uh, point for our geology. Here's just a view around uh, the McDowell Mountains showing that they're pretty much all comprised of Proterozoic units with just a little bit of tertiary flanking them. So I'm going to finish off with a quick couple of tours. We'll start the first one, Grand Canyon to Phoenix. And so this is uh, from Google Earth. And we're starting out here in space. We see Phoenix area here in the m lower middle. Um, here's Lake Powell. Go into the Grand Canyon over to Lake Mead. Uh, here's Salton Sea and San Andreas system. So let's zoom into the um, area of the Grand Canyon. And we can see pretty well the geology and how it's reflected in the topography. So there's an important, you know, the Proterozoic basement here is about 1.8 billion years old. There's a little bit of uh, kind of billion year old sedimentary units here underneath the main Paleozoic sequence. But the, the that main bedded section goes from the Tapeats at about 550 million up to about 280 here in the Kaibab. And that Kaibab limestone in this environment holds up the plateau. Now one the important thing to see is here on the edge of Kaibab up, uplift and here at Gray Mountain is one of our monoclines and that gives us that relief. Now we're zooming in to see some of the really famous volcanic rocks around Flagstaff. Here's SP Crater and its lava flow. We can go down here to the uh, Sunset Crater area. The last eruption in Arizona was about uh, 1066 AD and uh, was something that the Native Americans interacted with. There's Flagstaff and just north of Flagstaff then is this big Pliocene to recent volcanic system. We know the uh, Mount Humphreys, the highest mountain in uh, Arizona. And then as we head south here looking over the area of Sedona, we can see some of the Colorado Plateau sediments kind of coming out and we see the edge of that that sequence. So the Sedona town is here and all those red rocks are some of the same red ones we see in the Grand Canyon. And then you see the nice flat plateau to the north. Let's fly over by Jerome. We can see uh, the town of Jerome and, and the uh, normal faulting that had been active here sort of brings up some of the ore deposits in the foot wall right here that were kind of what made Jerome famous. Now let's head down to Phoenix. We can see uh, southeast Phoenix and um, zoom in to the South Mountains and the Sierra Estrellas just to the left there. Flip things up. This is the topography is exaggerated three times so we can really see the South Mountains and we see from where they came they sort of pulled up from underneath that transition zone there in the uh, on the east side of Phoenix. Okay so let's look at the stratigraphy up there on the plateau we see the bottom of the Grand Canyon was metamorphic rocks against the Paleozoic going up into, in that case, just to the Mesozoic uh, base. And then off, if we were in um, northeastern Arizona, we would have been able to see the Mesozoic sequence quite well. The uh, Glen Canyon area, Vermilion Cliffs, this is the uh, time of dinosaurs coming up. And then a, a, not much Cenozoic cover, but a little bit. Uh, Northeastern Arizona, we see some volcanism around Flagstaff. That volcanism is more evident, but we've we've got even less Mesozoic and, and Paleozoic preserved. When we come to Prescott and Jerome, we're removing all the pa Mesozoic, just have a little bit of Paleozoic, and we're getting a bit thicker Cenozoic as we get some of the fault basins from basin range time accumulating debris. Now let's go from Eastern Arizona to Tucson.
So we have the same setup here. Uh, Phoenix in the middle, lower middle. We're looking off to the plate boundary. Here's the San Andreas system. Now we'll head over to the White Mountains in eastern Arizona. This is another uh, Pliocene volcanic complex with some young volcanism in the north around um, Sholo area. And um, it, this is the headwater of the Salt River. So if we go in here to the area of the Salt River Gorge, we can see some of the older sedimentary rocks in Arizona. These are billion-year-old uh, Apache group. And these dark layers are actually sills that are intruded into the Apache group in this area. So this is a view to the east. We can uh, sort of spin around here, look down the river, and see this uh, zone of these older transition zone rocks and then heading, looking off towards uh, western Arizona. Fly over to Phoenix. Should be getting familiar. We have South Mountains in the middle, Sierra Estrellas, White Tanks up in the upper left there. Topography here is only exaggerated one time, so it's not as strong. You can see the White Tanks off to the left, and here's the really nice view of the South Mountains. Head down towards Casa Grande, southern part of Phoenix area, Chandler Gilbert on the Queen Creek on the left there. Head down to Tucson. So here's Greater Tucson, Santa Rita Mountains on the right. Uh, Catalina's there in the north, and Phoenix Mountains on the left. So this is an important view because we can see just right here this break in topography really defines the big Catalina detachment fault that brings the Catalinas, mostly uh, basement rock, up from underneath the Tucson Mountains, which are the upper plate volcanic and sedimentary units of this big low angle detachment system. So importantly, in comparison to central Arizona, where the faults, these low angle faults dipped to the east, this one dips west, but accommodated the same deformation. So here we see that stratigraphy with uh, in the Salt River Canyon area, we saw those sills sitting right here in the Apache group in the late Proterozoic. A little bit of Paleozoic units were in there and some sedimentary fill. We went to Phoenix area. We see no Mesozoic or Paleozoic. Our uh, oldest rocks are these Miocene units that we see in Papago Park, part of the early stage of extension and basin opening on top of those uh, low angle faults. We have some intrusions like the South Mountain granite and granodiorite, and then important volcanism seen in the superstitions. Our youngest uh, eruptions were in kind of North Phoenix, coming to maybe about six million years ago, these basalts, and so latest Miocene basalts. We go down towards Tucson. We see a, th a thickening, so we have some Paleozoic and Mesozoic preserved associated with some of the sedimentary basins that developed there. The tertiary is almost exactly the same as Phoenix with the same intrusion uh, relationships with the volcanic rocks like the Tucson Mountains and then uh, into basin fill and even somewhat younger uh, activity of eruptions and basalt formation. So this last slide shows this masterpiece of uh, cross-section of that was drawn by Steve Reynolds in 1996 and it goes all the way from the Pacific Plate to the Great Plains and you can see overall thinning of the lithosphere due to the basin range extension but we can also see things like the San Andreas is this pretty fine feature that chops off the, uh, the Pacific Plate fragment moves it relatively uh, into the view here but it really cuts off that Mesozoic kind of classic margin. You see this subduction zone here preserved. There's the old arc in the Sierra Nevadas. And then when we get in the basin range, we see both the low angle detachment style of deformation as well as these high angle structures that cut across even some of our Paleozoic thrust systems that we talked about in the last lecture. This here's the Sevier thrust belt. Here we're coming into something like the Hurricane Fault, so kind of westernmost Grand Canyon. There you see that faulted 
monocline that's been slid back down. Uh, kind of this would be the Grand Canyon Sea area here. So important deformed uh, basement rocks with that cover of Paleozoic units. And then we get finally into the uh, Rocky Mountains with this important kind of uplifted core along these high angle reverse faults that formed during the Laramide times when that uh, deformation was far on the continental interior and that even shed debris onto the Great Plains forming important sedimentary units of practical importance like the Ogallala Formation which is the great aquifer of the Great Plains. So there is in kind of one piece, one view all of uh, western US and if you can imagine this was an actual test question um, and uh, this was the key